It's my pleasure to introduce our very first presenter today. Lauren Forrest is a partner with our New York office and the Black Affinity Group co-chair. Lauren, floor is yours. I'd like to thank everyone, mostly Dr. Uh, Torian Easterling for being here today and every single other person who's on this call. Um, friends of mine, family on this call, clients, uh, I think this should be a fun and interesting discussion, a great way to sort of kick off Black History Month. Um, for those who don't, for those who don't know uh, Dr. Easterling, Torian Easterling is the first Deputy Commissioner and Chief Equity Officer of the New York City Department of Health. He's a proud graduate of Morehouse College and Rutgers Medical School. He's also a proud graduate of St. Benedict's Preparatory High School in Newark. For those of you who live in the New York region or who fly in and out or travel here, you might have seen Dr. Easterling on commercials about New York City's COVID response team. He's on billboards. He's, he's, he's the face of the pandemic, I think, for New York City health. He's a busy man. Um, my son literally knows him as the big black doctor on TV, which I think is great. Um, so, you know, I want to extend, uh, you know, our warmest um, thanks to Dr. Easterling and the crew from New York City Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene for having him here today um, and for being so gracious to spend some time with us. So, first of all, thank you, Dr. Easterling, for being here. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Holland and Knight uh, for, for centering Black History Month and, and even just being able to tell my story. So appreciate it. Thank you. So 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 let's get right to it. Um, your story. That's so important. Can you briefly, you know, tell us about your journey from I think it's East Orange slash Newark to St. Benedict's, which is I think one of the better, if not best, uh, high schools in the area, if not the country, and then to Morehouse and then to Rutgers Medical School. And feel free to add any color to that journey or uh, anecdotes that you think are important. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. And, uh, and I'm gonna hold you to it. St. Benedict's Prep is, is one of the best schools in Jersey. Um, well, first, let me just start off, uh, you know, how, um, how honored I am uh, to, to even be recognized during this month. You know, I remember just growing up in New Jersey uh, February, you know, there was such a focus on Dr. King, Rosa Parks, the civil rights mo uh, movement. And, and now we sort of see this expansion. The narrative is, is much broader around what it means to talk about this beautiful struggle of liberating Black people, people of African descent in this country and acknowledging that our story certainly did not start with slavery, has not ended with slavery, and we're continuing to tell our story. And so to, to have this opportunity to be a part of that thread, that fabric, uh, is such an honor for me. Um, but, you know, to, to your question, you know, I, as you've already mentioned, I grew up in New Jersey. And, you know, certainly I have, in my memories, and what has shaped my experience um, is a lot of just joyful memories, happy memories. Uh, and certainly, you know, as you get older and you understand that, you know, some of the memories that you have just shouldn't be, right? Why am I growing up in a single parent household? Although I knew my father, know my father continue to this day, I'm still in a single parent household. You know, uh, understanding some of the statistics and the stories of crime and homelessness, uh, you know, and, and also dealing with, you know, poverty in the neighborhoods that I'm growing up in, you know, but that's not, you know, that's not what you experience. You almost understand like this is normal, right? That, you know, you get to interact with your friends, you go to school, you come back home, you get to interact with your family. And, you know, like all of these memories have shaped what it, what does it absolutely mean for me to be doing the work that I'm doing today? So grew up in East Orange, uh, you know, grew up in Newark. Uh, I went to St. Benedict's Prep and some of the things that have really been important for me at St. Benedict's Prep which uh, previously was an all boys high school. Uh, and the things that I loved uh, about St. Benedict's is everyone wasn't pushed to play basketball. Everyone wasn't, we didn't have a football team. I did fencing, water polo, lacrosse. Uh, and so my ability to experience other schools, travel to other uh, institutions, because we had to go to Connecticut to play uh, water polo, right? How many water polo teams are in North New Jersey? There was one, uh, my high school. Um, and we had to travel to Pennsylvania to play lacrosse, you know, and so that is certainly understood that we needed to broaden our, our experience. And then I, I also had an opportunity to do a lot of backpacking through St. Benedict. So, you know, that it was really important um, that, you know, it wasn't just about the things that we know, like 
play basketball or get a job, you know, or take care of your family if you were a teenage parent. So, um, you know, that that helped and went to Morehouse College, you know, on the Red Clay, Red Clay Hill of Georgia, you know, this immaculate uh, institution that affirmed the identity of Black boys uh, coming from all over the country and the world, uh, understanding some of the esteemed alumni who have walked through those halls. Uh, it was such an honor uh, to be a part of the institution. And it, it literally uh, shaped uh, the man and the physician I am today. That's a great, 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 great story. So tell us um, how you came to the idea of even going to medical school and tell us, you know, how you, how you get, how you make that decision somewhere in, you know, in college. Yeah, you know, so the story uh, for me is that it started at a young age. Uh, and I, rem I recall, you know, telling my mother I was going to become a physician. Uh, and, uh, and I just remember her response being supportive. I don't remember her exact words. And so that, in that initial conversation sort of actually shaped the, the idea that this was really possible, right? And, and I think that's important to note because the moment that we kill a dream, uh, then you know, we understand that five years, 10 years down the line, you know, oftentimes uh, we're not really um, you know, putting that person in a position to follow through. And so you know, I was certainly supported at a very young age. Uh, and again, through high school, I was able to do a number of different experiential uh, opportunities, you know, uh, rotating through uh, the emergency department at, at UMDNJ, their university hospital, which is the medical school that I went to, uh, and also shadowing some physicians, you know, so there were opportunities and you just continue to seek them out. Um, and then going to, to Morehouse, uh, you know, what was really important about being at a historically black college, uh, you know, I talked about sort of shaping identity uh, and what's so important about historic black colleges is that they help reaffirm your culture, uh, understand that your memories are important, but you are not just your memories. And there's opportunities to grow beyond those memories. Uh, and then the other thing that's, uh, I think is also really important is um, pushing past societal labels, right? And so again, we only think about black boys going to, uh, going to play basketball or working. Morehouse, you know, Prevented, uh, presented uh, limitless opportunities for Black boys, right? You are seeing um, Black boys from all over the country who are surfing, who are backpacking, who want to be the president of the United States, who want to be a congressperson. You know, my, my classmate is the mayor of um, Birmingham, Alabama, who was a student president uh, for, for our council. And, and I think that really just uh, really pushed us to understand that we could do anything, right? Even if you didn't believe it when you when you started at Morehouse, you certainly left that institution with that understanding uh, that you could attain any possible dream that you have. Uh, and that helped me think about uh, the opportunities that I could uh, um, succeed in as a physician, but not only as a physician, but what does it mean for us to sit at a table and think about the decisions that really shape uh, the health of this country. And so, you know, certainly at Morehouse was actually the first time that I even thought that it was possible to even think about uh, becoming uh, even the U.S. Surgeon General. Now, do I want it at this very moment? You know, the, the, the question remains uh, still open, but certainly I, I, it has crossed my mind, you know, as a, as a student at Morehouse College, because there are so many examples of leaders, of individuals who have achieved uh, an immense amount of success uh, that has really opened the doors for me. Excellent, excellent, powerful words. So tell me, um, I think I read a little bit about you um, and I was reading in an interview, you said that there was an experience, I believe in Africa and, and also I think another experience in the New Orleans, which changed your, your mind to go from, I think a trauma surgeon into family medicine. Can you tell us how, you, how, how those experiences shaped you as well? Yeah, yeah, the, it was a really interesting experience. So, you know, a, a lot of the work uh, that I've been able to do while a medical student uh, and a resident, and, and let me just help folks understand, you know, yes, I'm a full, I was a full-time medical student, but full-time resident, 
people understand that's four years uh, of medical school, first two years are all spent in the classroom and the second two years, you're rotating through the hospital, completing all of your uh, rotations through the specialties. And then residency, obviously that depends on the specialty, the number of years uh, that, um, that you have to spend, whether three, three years to seven years, depending on surgery. And so the, the opportunity for me to spend my initial summers, the summer between my first year and my second year of medical school, I uh, traveled to Ghana, West Africa, and I, I had an opportunity to engage with traditional healers. Uh, so, you know, clinicians and providers who really focused on plant medicine, uh, but then also uh, Western trained physicians. So these are the physicians that are serving patients in uh, the hospitals in Accra, uh, also in Kumasi, which are you know large cities within Ghana, and so really understanding uh, that the continuum of care does not start and end in the hospital. Uh, that we have to really look at the communities and the villages that individuals are coming from. Uh, I had an opportunity to sit down with um, community health workers uh, when I was in Ghana who focused on maternal health. Now imagine that you're in a village where there's limits on the electricity, limits on water and access to resources. You do not have time to travel to a hospital to have a physician deliver your baby. And so you had actually community health workers, doulas who were actually the ones going or midwives uh, was actually the term they were using, uh, going to, uh, to see their patients, making sure that they were checking in. And it really just expanded my mind around how care is provided. And certainly we see this often, uh, particularly in uh, communities of color, low-income communities, uh, that it isn't just about access. Uh, there's uh, this idea of, you know, are the institutions set up for me, right? Do I belong? Can I access those services? And there has been histories of injustices in medical institutions. And so we break down that invisible barrier. And so really wanted to be in that gap. How do I communicate and translate information to communities to make sure that yes, these services are in fact for you. And yes, on the opposite end, how are we reaffirming and redesigning these systems so that they can better fit and serve communities? Wow, that's a powerful story. So thank you so much. And I want to fast forward a little bit to your, your role with the city, right? You're, you're obviously a head doctor there, but you're also chief equity officer and you seem to, you know, came into this position at a time of great strife in the United States, you know, the events dealing with, you know, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, horrible events, Omar, Ahmaud Arbery. Um, and we only, I only started saying chief diversity or chief equity officer. Um, can you tell us how you think those horrible events of 2020 and some that may still be occurring, how are they shaping, you know, your practice of, quote, you know, quote, unquote, medicine and your position as chief office, equity officer within the city? Yeah, I think that the, we, there's, a, there's a bit of a reawakening. Um, that has happened uh, over the last couple of years um, for, for anyone who thought we achieved at some you know, post-racial unity uh, after having uh, our first black president in this country quickly realized that we have not, we have not arrived. Uh, and I think initially, I think what has been clear is the, um, the, the opportunity to raise awareness about the societal inequities that exist uh, across this country and that um, there has to be more work that our institutions and our organizations, even in, in our workforce that we have to do to really open up the space to allow people to show up in authentic ways, um, to make sure that your workplace practices are reaffirming uh, to, to people and supporting their well-being. Uh, when we think about sort of the intersection of equity and public health and social justice, um, you know, I sort of think about this concept of belonging. Uh, and something that I understood was really important for me when I went through, uh, through college and medical school, uh, but our workplaces need to do more to increase uh, this, this sense of belonging in their institutions. And certainly what we see uh, is that just naming a chief diversity officer who is solely uh, focused on increasing representation is not going to cut it. You know, I have to be really clear and transparent and so there has to be a broader conversation, a broader conversation about, yes, how do we normalize language, not only about race and racism, um, how do we think about improving our work, 
workplace practices that are more equitable for every single person, right? So that no one seems or feels invisible in the spaces that they occupy uh, at their workplace. Uh, and then how do we in increase our institutional accountability, right? What leverage do we have? What policies can we put in place? What change management processes are important? Uh, and that's, that's the work of equity, is closing the gap. It's understanding that what, it, what our normal state is, is that there are advantages to one group over other, and those disadvantages unfairly uh, impact um, people, not only for their, uh, the, you know, sort of their economic outcomes, but also their health outcomes as well. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you anymore. Um, and I want to talk a little bit because you brought up, um, you know, uh, inequities and those sorts of things. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that, you know, are in our title today. COVID and inequities, right, and disparities, right? So as an employment lawyer, I service a lot of hotels, restaurants, banks, businesses, even liquor stores, right? Places that were fairly, or in some instances, unfairly designated as essential workers, right? Essential services, right? So a lot of, I say us, Black folks, or people of color, um, women, and especially in the health services field, were designated, you know, essential workers, right? So from my, my optics is that a lot of us were, you know, overly impacted by COVID, right? And some, I have friends who died from COVID, um, guys I played basketball with, um, some healthcare professionals that I know. How, how are you dealing with that in your position about the, those sort of A, health inequities, right? And then B, even the, the mental health inequities. And I know sort of a two-parter, but I, I wanted to explore that issue about the over-representation of, of, of fortunately Black folks in those COVID sicknesses, illness, and essential workers. Yeah, yeah, and just to pick up on the point that um, we were making on a previous question um, is that, you know, we just, we, we already knew that there were these inequities um, prior to the pandemic, uh, and we haven't changed the environment and the systems that are set up to really serve people. Whether you think about, you know, Hurricane Sandy, whether you think about the Ebola crisis, we have seen pandemics, epidemics, we have seen emergencies burden those who are impoverished, certain burden those who are you know, in communities of color, uh, and then also thinking about other intersecting systems of oppression, whether you uh, identify as LGBTQIA or, or, or your religious identities. And I think this is the conversation that we have to reckon with. As we move from uh, the response to COVID-19 pandemic into recovery, uh, what are the type of, of investments that we need to make that, that broadens the conversation around prevention uh, and, and stop waiting for us to be so reactive to everything that shows up in our communities and in our, our healthcare system. Um, so the, the ways that the, uh, the health department has been thinking about this, uh, sort of three lanes. Um, we absolutely have to have as our top priority um, how are we responding to COVID-19 first and foremost, right? That has, uh, we have been laser focused. We have seen hospitalizations and deaths uh, and cases, infections uh, show up uh, in uh, inequitable ways by race and ethnicity. Two to three times more likely to die if you're black or brown uh, versus if you are white or Asian. And so that was our first one. Second, we need to really think about uh, our mass vaccination campaign. This is the largest vaccination campaign that this city has ever seen um, and the world has ever seen. And so how do we, from the very beginning, uh, the rollout of the campaign, think about addressing equity, uh, meaning who has been most burdened by this pandemic and how are we engaging them, really building their confidence and supporting an informed decision uh, to, do, to take the vaccine. And, and then third is recognizing that there are parallel pandemics. If we weren't dealing with COVID-19, the things that we will be talking about and has already been in the news, certainly are severe mental illness, right? We have already seen the reports uh, of uh, incidents in subways. We have already seen reports of violence across this city. Um, and we know that uh, uh, what we have seen over the past two years uh, is a major significant increase uh, in the number of opioid overdose deaths and the greatest inequities still continue to be in black and brown communities. 
Um, and that's if we weren't dealing with COVID-19, we would be talking about uh, these major outbreaks and epidemics across this city. Um, and so, you know, as a, one of the largest public health agencies, we couldn't say, all right, we only have this major public health emergency, we're just gonna focus on that. No, we needed to make sure that we were also had our eye and we were laser focused on these parallel pandemics. Um, we are very concerned, I'm certainly concerned about what's to come, the way of dealing with mental health issues uh, as a result of this pandemic. And for those of us who are, you know, who are doing well right now, stable, I am still concerned about those who continue to be functional um, because we have all been impacted by this pandemic and not just adults. And for those of us who are on this call, we are certainly concerned about our young folks young folks who have you know, had to deal with online learning and then shifting into in-person learning, uh, young people who have lost their caregivers, their parents as a result of this pandemic. Uh, and so we understand that there is certainly a major crisis that we're, we have on our hands as we deal with recovery. There are things that we have in place that help us identify and screen individuals, help people get connected uh, to the type of care and resources um, while also advocating for the right type of investments. Uh, but uh, our starting point uh, is, is very, we're very clear that we do not have the right infrastructure and system set up. Um, our starting point, uh, we were already at a deficit, uh, particularly because uh, as you are sort of making this connection, uh, there are nuances about how people sort of come to terms with mental health, right? It has been very stigmatizing. It has been poorly invested. And we have really not centered it in the way that we sort of keep um, put it on equal, uh, equal footing with our physical health. Uh, and so how are we reframing this as overall health and well-being, and really making sure that we're connecting with, again, all aspects of, of individuals. Wow, wow, thank you so much. Hey, you know what I'm struck by that you use uh, a word that I, I tell people to use when they want to build, when they want to bond, we. And I think that's so important. Like we haven't done this, we haven't done this. Not like you or I or the government, like we, you know, as a culture, as a society, haven't done some things. So drawing upon that we sort of thing, mm -hmm. what do you think we need to do to help A, and I know you're big on, you know, um, pushing vaccines and boosters. What do we need to do to A, you know, get more people of color a to because we are on the front lines and we're i think disproportionately affected to take the vaccine and, and can you explain for the people who want to call who might not know why you know that there might be i think a greater or higher degree of vaccine hesitancy in the black community and also maybe i think it might dovetail with the idea of the the hesitancy among some people of color and black and brown communities not to you know seek out you know a mental health treatment so i know it's a two-part question i can re throw the second one in if you need it again my, my apologies no no no, no. It's, it's fine it's fine i think that they're absolutely connected and uh, i'll start with the second question first because i think grounding us in that information will sort of help to sort of what are the right next steps um so i think about it in four parts when you think about uh vaccine hesitancy and the model, the way that we sort of wrap our minds around it. Um, we have to add an equity lens, right? There have been deep historical and contemporary justice as it relates to the medical system. They still exist to this very at this very moment. Um, you know, and, and Lauren, I, I was sharing with you, you know, I have um, uh, almost two-year-old daughter. Uh, but when, you, when I think about the fear that I had you know, my wife going in for her pregnancy, despite my education, you know, the achievements that I have, that, you know, I'm still, my wife is still counted among, you know, overall, the number of black women that have higher risk uh, of delivering in this city compared to say, a white woman who only has a high school education. So even our education status does not protect us or protect our women, our families from having a safe and respectful care. Right. And so we have to deal with those deep historical and contemporary injustices that still are present. And, you know, not forgetting that, yes, some people are thinking about, you know, Tuskegee, right? That, that is still in the back of the mind for our older generation. Some people still understand that uh, there were intentional uh, uh, approaches and strategies uh, to make Black women and other women of color infertile. Right. And so these were all documented. And, and so how are we addressing 
uh, those injustices in the in in the idea of sort of now putting out a new biomedical intervention like a vaccine. The other three lanes are sort of thinking about is confidence, right? Um, there's been a lot of conversation around the science, you know, around the data, you know, from the very beginning and in the previous administration, there was, uh, you know, really an attention to undermine uh, science and data, and that has called or caused a ripple effect not just among, uh, you know, sort of your political affiliation, but particularly within uh, Black communities. Uh, there were targeted disinformation, misinformation that was sent. And we have seen, um, you know, large anti-vax uh, campaigns uh, that have been specifically focused on communities of color. The other is complacency. We have gone through four waves. We're on our fourth wave right now. This Omicron wave is really, uh, you know, has been, um, you know, uh, really a rude awakening that we can't, we cannot let down our guard, right? And so uh, what ended up happening uh, after the uh, second wave, which was driven by Delta, the third wave also driven by Delta, the Delta variant, um, between the second and third, people got really relaxed. We had an amazing summer. People were just so happy to rejoin one another and get out and just cook out. And then we hit this third wave and people were like, oh, wow, I need to go get my vaccine. We cannot be complacent, right? We, we, we just, even though the cases are going down right now, even though we're seeing a trend downward in the hospitalizations, our deaths are still high. And so what I would say is that if you haven't got vaccinated, it is so important even now, because we know that our global vaccine um, approach, we still haven't re reached a vaccine coverage that we need to be at. So there's more work that we need to do. We cannot be complacent. And then the last is just convenience. Uh, New York City is in a different, is different state, right? But when you think about access, when you think about the ability to just walk out of your, your office space or your home and just be able to walk somewhere and get a vaccine, um, we, we do not have that uh, across this country and certainly not across the world. New York City has a different infrastructure where, you know, we now have vaccine sites um, in every neighborhood that, you know, we can literally say that you are less than a mile away from a vaccine site, whether that is a city run site, whether that's a pharmacy, whether that is a hospital, you can literally go out and get a vaccine. But that convenience is not true in every state, right, in every country. And so there is absolutely a, an important attention that policymakers and government must sort of look at as they think about uh, convenience. Um, and so, you know, when we think about the we, uh, you know, the, the, what can we all do? For those of us who are vaccinated, tell your story. Uh, uh, people want to connect uh, to individuals that they trust, and those messages are really important. And so we're not, I'm not saying be a nag. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, hammer the point home, but really support them. Listen to their question, listen to their concerns, and then tell your story as to why you got vaccinated. Um, and I think we all have to collectively be, um, be watchful about the misinformation. Uh, we have seen an increase in the public discourse trying to undermine uh, the idea of why equity is needed. You know, obviously, you know, uh, what has continued to be controversial among so many is this idea of critical race theory. Um, and essentially what it, what it does is it targets communities of color uh, in unfair ways. And I think we have to all be laser focused on making sure uh, that we are disarming misinformation, disinformation, uh, and making sure that individuals are getting that factual information. Thank, thank you for that. That was, that was all so important and so necessary, everything you said. So and I want to keep piggyback upon this issue of medical equity. Um, I'm a lawyer, right? I think I'm a good advocate. I think I can argue and persuade and control. Um, but one issue that I'm lucky I haven't really faced a lot is, uh, you know, medical inequities, right? So what would be your advice? And again, sort of, sort of a two-parter. In an individual context, right? What do we do when, we're, when we are confronted with like a medical, you know, perceived inequity? You know, whether it is that someone is not treating us right as a disabled person or an Asian person or an LGBTQ person or, or what have you, how, to, how is an average citizen, you know, supposed to deal with that? Because there's so many other things like the EEOC and boards, but I don't even know, you know, as an employment attorney, what to tell someone when you think your doctor 
um, is 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 doing something, you know, not blatantly racist, but some or you know, blatantly, you know, sexual and inappropriate, but but suddenly something that seems inequitous and that seems to be based on a characteristic that it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think the two points that I um, I just want to lift up, uh, you know, as a result of the, the question. Um, one, I think that we should all care about inequities and how resources are distributed, particularly around healthcare. Um, uh, essentially, uh, if we all care about equity, um, we are advocating for you know equal access, equitable access to resources, equitable type of care. Well, they're not just talking about availability, but also the quality uh, of care. Uh, and it also circles back to this idea of you know belonging in humanity that people can show up and be seen and be heard and that their concerns, uh, someone's going to listen to them. And so, you know, I, I think that it's really important that we all see this uh, as a fight that we all must join and call out. Um, you know, the, one of the ways that I sort of like, like to make the connections, because, you know, a lot of people focus on healthcare system, um, but it's much broader because essentially we're trying to ensure that all of the different systems that uh, support someone's health, uh, it, which is much larger than just the healthcare system. You're talking about the food that someone access. You're talking about the quality and availability uh, of, uh, of one's home, uh, the minimization of violence and improving public safety. Because all of these different factors engage in, into, um, can sort of weave into you know, their well-being, and we need to really do more to make sure uh, that we're creating better neighborhoods and better environments for people to, to live in. Um, but you know, the, the, to the second point, I'm really getting more focused into the question around, well, what, what do I do? Um, you know, there, there are a number of different ways and, uh, you know, and I certainly get this question as well. Um, I think you know, there, you know, healthcare systems all need to have some level of ombudsperson or mediation or sort of a patient care navigator that uh, should be taking in these concerns, right? If you feel as though uh, that wrong has been done, um, then I think there are ways in which you should be able to elevate those concerns to uh, someone in leadership. Um, certainly that's, that's not always the case uh, and you may not always feel like you're being listened to, but though that is just one structure just to call out. The other thing that I, um, I know that you know, lots of, of advocates and, and organizations have been working on, um, you know, similar to Yelp and, and other sort of rating apps, is really being able to, to, you know, to identify, uh, are you receiving uh, the right type of services at this uh, healthcare system? Uh, I want to call out one app like that, the, uh, the Earth uh, app. Uh, so think about B, but without the B, just called IRTH Earth app. Uh, and uh, this, this is being led by uh, a reproductive advocate, uh, Kimberly Seals Allers, who has been you know, implementing this system to say, well, um, what are the right healthcare systems that are uh, you know, showing dignity, uh, showing safe and respectful care for birthing people? And I think that's you know, sort of the, uh, another way uh, that we can ensure that people are accessing the right type of institutions that are caring for, you know, for, for family members. Um, and then I can also say that one of the things that we have been really doing, uh, you know, with healthcare systems uh, is working on their training to address implicit bias and discrimination in healthcare systems, putting in policies and practices like a patient's bill of rights to ensure that uh, individuals who are coming in for services are receiving, uh, you know, safe and respectful, respectful services. And so, you know, I, th I think from an individual sort of thinking about how advocacy works and then, you know, how government can show up. I think those are some three clear ideas. Great, great. In question, because you, you brought this up, um, in terms of a holistic view of medicine, right? You talked about, you know, violence growing up where you grew up. Is it, And this is just, I'm sorry, we didn't discuss this, but just a little question about, is your office working with like um, the police department or other, you know, safety things about maybe increased responses to maybe mental health issues to maybe violence in, you know, communities of all communities, of, you know, not just those of color, because that does affect, you know, our mental health and our outlook at a time when, you know, mental health is greatly strained. So are there programs in place that the city is, you know, sort of understanding that this is a time where 
maybe, you know, not just with regard to race, but with regard to mental health, that people need care, maybe sometimes more than they need a harder police response and protection, you know, at the same time, so that we don't have these social slash racial inequities that greatly, you know, dec decrease or diminish our health. Yeah, you know, I, I'm so glad you circle back to this um, because although I did say that, you know, our starting point, uh, there are major deficits, you know, there has been some significant investments uh, that New York City has made uh, over the last several years, even in the previous administration. Um, you know, one, uh, one area that we have done uh, an immense amount of work is expanding what we call our mobile treatment teams. Uh, those mobile treatment teams respond to mobile crisis. Uh, so individuals can uh, receive a deployed team uh, from a hospital uh, who would come in uh, and if someone uh, is you know, acting erratic or needs to be connected to care immediately, uh, you know, we can deploy a mobile treatment team. Uh, and then that's in, that's in all five boroughs. Uh, and that's really important uh, that we are able to uh, deploy those type of services. You know, I have, uh, you know, deployed those services in a number of different instances. Uh, even for uh, colleagues, um, also for family members. And so do you know that individuals can uh, access them either through 911 or through uh, what we call NYC Well, which is our 24 hour, seven day a week call line in the city. Uh, so you can uh, call at any time, text or chat, um, essentially you know, be able to talk with someone. If you, you're in, in fact are having, uh, you know, symptoms of depression or uh, you need to talk to someone or if you need to reach out and connect a family member or a colleague or someone that you're seeing is acting erratic and needs, needs to be connected to services um, I, so that both nyc well our mobile crisis team the other um, so we do have uh, you know um, deployed teams uh, that are in uh, high-risk neighborhoods to really address severe mental illness, um, a program where we are working with behavioral health clinicians and NYPD to respond uh, to more high profile, high risk uh, type of calls uh, where NYPD has to be called, but we also want a behavioral health clinician uh, on site as well. Um, they were previously called sort of our emotionally disturbed person's calls. Um, and they often route it through 911. And so, yes, uh, those are ways in which we have, you know, one, tried to really address inequities and two, make sure uh, that we're pairing um, behavioral health clinicians with law enforcement. That's great. That's great. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. I'm assuming it sounds like some of these people would have responded to the horrible incident in the Bronx with that fire. It sounds like they would have been, that would have been part of the response team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, our team and so many others, and, and we're still there, uh, you know, even weeks after uh, that uh, horrific incident, um, but we have our team still deployed in the community, making sure that we're connecting individuals to resources. Wow. And, and then let me, I will only have maybe one or two questions left. Um, I would ask you this, because you brought this up. State to state, unfortunately, the United States does not have a uniform response to like COVID and mass mandates and vaccination, you know, need or want or regulation. What would you say to people who want to protect themselves and they don't live in a state with some of these mass mandates? So then maybe their employer has called everyone back or their essential worker and they don't mandate masks and they don't mandate vaccinations in the office. Because I was reading a lot in the Ethicist and the Times. Some people are like, well, what do I do? There's no mass mandate. You know, I live in Florida, Georgia, or Texas, and there's no mandatory vaccination, and I'm incredibly worried. Uh, how do you think people should deal, you know, if you know, and I know every situation is totally different, but what would be some common sense advice you might, you know, want to give to those folks? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I think that it is, it is important to really lift this up because, um, you know, even without policies, you know, like a mass policy, universal mass policy, or even vaccine mandates, you know, there are things that you can do, right? You, you can wear your mask. Uh, and we know that higher grade masks like KN95s or KF94s help limit the spread, particularly when you're either higher risk or you may be in high risk settings. Um, obviously, making sure that you're up to date with, uh, with your vaccine. So that means your primary series, uh, uh, two doses of an mRNA vaccine or one dose of the Johnson Johnson plus your booster. Um, and so doing all the things that we've been talking about, right, for the, for the last two years uh, is really, really key. 
Um, I think there, there are also some other protections that, you know, many, um, you know, offices have uh, in really making sure that they're leveraging, you know, reasonable accommodation um, to, to if, if need be, um, you know, to, to make sure that you're keeping yourself safe. Uh, for whatever reason, I think that individuals should make, you know, should absolutely leverage those, those protections. Absolutely, absolutely. And so one last question before we start to open it up with questions. And for everyone who's listening in, um, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, we, can, we can sort of get to some of those questions. I see about four. I was expecting more. Um, so feel free, anyone who's on the call, to you know, send us your questions, comments, um, things that we can continue the discussion about because we're going to open it up soon. But um, you know, before the call, you spoke a little bit about you know, being the face of COVID, quote unquote, in, the, in New York City. Um, and I was, you know, struck by some of the things you said. Uh, my, you know, I've never been the face of anything. I think once I was the face of a bad labor campaign in Brooklyn, and there was, there was some signs with my um, picture on it, um, and I didn't feel so bad about that. But I want to hear from you, so the good and bad side of, of, you know, the fight and struggle that you've been in the last two or three years. Yeah, yeah. I'll start by just saying it's been deeply humbling. Uh, you know, I certainly did not come uh, to the health department to become the face of anything. Uh, deeply, um, you know, committed uh, and, and passionate by uh, the work that we do here, uh, addressing uh, inequities, you know, really being able to leverage our resources uh, and, and just the collaboration, uh, working with sectors across New York City and in other jurisdictions um, to really ensure that we're improving health and advancing the health equity agenda. So, you know, that's my starting point. Um, and, and so this has been an absolute uh, wild ride. Uh, there have been uh, ups and downs, certainly more downs than ups, um, you know, because this has just been a really taxing and devastating pandemic. Um, but uh, there have been bright, bright spots and bright moments, um, you know, and, and certainly the PSAs are one of them. Uh, the ability to, uh, to be seen and recognize uh, the impact that I uh, hear about, uh, not only from, uh, from parents, um, but also from children. Uh, and I remember, recall a story of a parent coming up to me. Uh, you know, saying that, you know, my, my son wants to get a haircut just like you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, and I thought that was just uh, so amazing uh, that because, you know, that, that young boy saw himself uh, in me. And I think it is so important because we have seen, you know, over the course of a number of years uh, that with multiple media platforms, the increase in representation and by no means have we achieved what we need to, but we, um, but we, we are seeing an increase. Uh, but on the other other side of it, I do recognize that um, with with uh, that type of recognition and responsibility, uh, you know, there there is certainly the downside of it, and um, you know, certainly recall uh, an incident where you know a couple came up to me and just uh, you know you know rained me out because they thought that I was selling out the community, that they thought that I was giving bad information. Um, and uh, and, and in those moments, um, because other people witnessed it, uh, they came to my aid. Uh, they also began to argue with that couple and say, this is why the vaccines are safe and effective. I really didn't have to talk in that moment, uh, but, but I also just understand that I do need to be more vigilant, you know, being in the New York City streets and just watching myself. <laughs> wow, that, that's, that's great. And then I think so the last question um, before we get to open up the questions is, uh, the exact thing you just touched upon, um, what I refer to as allyship or allies, right? How, how did you feel when someone sort of came to your defense and said, hey, this is, this is how, how did you feel? And how, do you, and how do you think allies are so important in the struggle for social justice and medical equity? Yeah, yeah, I think that it is, it is it's critical. Uh, and we have seen, you know, strong ways, best practices that allies can step up. Um, you know, first and foremost, and I, I do not um, minimize this step of just listening and empathizing. Uh, you know, even as a physician, even as you know, a black man, you know, I don't start by saying, "Oh, I know, you know, what you're feeling," or "I know what your um, what your concerns are." I just listen. I open up and say, "What what are, what are your concerns?" Um, and I think that's a it's a really powerful starting place uh, for anyone who is really trying to build that trust and really try to motivate someone to, to do a behavioral modification. Um, and so I think that this, that's the starting point. I think that's how we build allyship. Um, but also I think that allies, uh, certainly the spaces that they occupy, recognizing privilege must speak up. 
at all times. And they cannot, uh, simply, we just do not have any more time to be silent. Uh, and actually silence is leading to violence. And so, you know, I, I cannot uh, just stress how important it is that we've seen in all the different avenues, whether you're using a social media platform, you're using your position, or you're, you're having the, the conversations, uh, even in your circles, uh, to advance, you know, really an equity agenda, racial and social justice agenda, I think is really important. Thank you, thank you for that. And I think uh, we're gonna open it up to some questions if that's okay with you. Sure. So um, these questions um, so far, mostly from anonymous folks. Um, so <laughs> that's okay. So um, I'm gonna read it out to you. How do you feel about Florida Surgeon General Ladepo and his, sorry, clownish positions and behavior? And are you able to do anything to undo the damage that he is doing? Yeah, yeah, I know it's, it's really, it's really unfortunate. Uh, that we are seeing uh, th this type of anti-vax, uh, you know, uh, really undermining public health information coming at a very high level. Um, and it, it's not just at the Surgeon General level, obviously it's also at the governor's level, you know, and, and this is what we have to use our collective voice, not just going to be New York City. I mean, really it's gonna be the collective voices of, of, of city, uh, state and federal partners continuing to not only uh, support the vaccine, the science and the data, but also denouncing a lot of this information. Uh, and we have done a number of different um, things at our agency. We have sent letters to YouTube. We have also joined in um, pushing Spotify to stop spewing misinformation. Um, and I think it's both corporations, but also uh, really um, making sure that governments are, are putting out the right type of information as well. So we'll, we'll continue to use our bully pulpit, but I think we all should. Absolutely, absolutely. So here's another question. It seems a, a sort of a 16, 19 question, if everyone's familiar with that. Um, how can we close economic and health equity gaps when the institutions built in this country are built on the foundation of racism? This country has become and remains quasi successful by exploiting citizens of marginal groups. At the risk of sounding pessimistic, can we really reform our way out of this? Yeah, that, that is the question. And, and if I had the answer, I certainly uh, would be a billionaire um, and you know, not to exploit uh, anyone, but you know, I think that is the answer that a lot of institutions who are really committed to this work are trying to answer um, you know, by bringing in consultants, um, by bringing in uh, experts, bringing in the voices of those with lived experiences. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I think the question is, uh, you know, what, what else do we do, right? And uh, for those of us who are in positions, um, we are certainly going to continue to push. Um, we're gonna to continue uh, to advocate and disrupt what we can. Um, and I think that we have to shift our language around uh, reforming and really it's about transformation and keeping uh, those outcomes. I think this is literally about life or death. Um, and I think that that's also what you're getting at the, the person's action, the question, um, because we have seen the, the exploitation, we have seen marginalized groups sort of bear the burden of all of these decisions. Uh, and so we wanna put uh, better processes in place place better structures uh, so that we can get um, better outcomes. Sure. And this may be a difficult question. The next one um, is from another anonymous person. I had, they say, I had, I had the first vaccine and not the second because of a rare, I think it's a type of rare reaction that I had to the first. I was at risk of losing my income because even though I had medical reason not to get the second, because even though I had a medical reason not to get the second vaccine, I was pressured. I was able to find a fully remote position and not lose my income. What should people who have a valid medical reason not to be vaccinated but are still being pressured by the employer to do and and comply and not lose their job? I'm sorry, it's such a tough question. Sorry about that. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's an important question, and I uh, you know certainly um, uh, hear the 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 um, the questioner, and so the, I do. Uh, you know, just sorry to hear about the, the reaction from the vaccine. Um, you know, I think uh, the next step after the first vaccine is to engage a provider um, to document what that reaction is or was from the first vaccine. Some reactions uh, based on that reaction, uh, the person would be advised not to get a second, the second dose. And once documented, 
you know, the, the person should be able to apply for reasonable accommodation. Um, and that, that is something that we have built into our processes. And so it is important for organizations and businesses to also incorporate it. Um, it there are instances where a reaction uh, does not warrant uh, the advice to avoid, but uh, there are other um, precautions that one would take prior to taking uh, that vaccine, whether, you know, depending on the, the symptom, if the person had um, a skin reaction, um, you know, but person has a short has shortness of breath or something more severe. Uh, certainly, the provider would would um, advise differently. So, I think that's why the next step is really to follow up with your provider and make sure that you have the documentation based on the reaction, uh, and then that provider will then uh, you know advise you on the right next steps. And certainly, that documentation should protect you for your for workplace practices. Yeah, and I would even, I happen to be an employment lawyer, so my only piggyback would be you should engage in the interactive process with your with your employer um, to let them, as, as Dr. Easterling said, so, you know, artfully that you document what your reasons are for not taking the vaccine, and then obviously you can request um, an accommodation from your employer, um, and then that'll be weighted out, and that should be a quote-unquote interactive a discussion that goes back and forth. Um, so and just moving to these questions in order so everyone understands that um, I'm not picking one over the other. Um, the next one's from an anonymous person, Dr. Easterling and Lauren, for many reasons like Tuskegee, I'm certainly referring to the Tuskegee experiment, um, communities of color suspicious of the healthcare system, Black people remain underserved and underrepresented. Our BIPOC, and I believe that means um, Black, Indigenous, and other peoples of color, communities right to be suspicious. What things can we all be doing to engender greater trust in the Black community and greater response on that from the healthcare system? Yeah, now this is these are conversations I've been having for the last two years. Um, uh, and, and I certainly, uh, as I stated before, um, have always started off by acknowledging the historical and contemporary injustices uh, that occur in medical systems that have actually been related to scientific experiments. Um, the Tuskegee uh, experiment was related to uh, a medication, withholding a medication. Uh, and so I, I do think it's important and, you know, to really unpack our history and what has happened, um, but we cannot be stuck there. We, we absolutely have to do it in a trauma-informed way, you know, showing empathy, laying out the facts, and then identifying ways that we can move forward. Um, if we continue to just focus on Tuskegee, I think that that also brings our own community harm. So th this this I think this is a conversation that we all must have. We can have it in small circles. You know, we do it on town halls. We talk amongst uh, many of the different sectors um, because there are amazing. There there is. It's just a, a lot of amazing work that are happening in community of colors across the city, supporting conversations, supporting individuals to uh, to help make an informed decision. Uh, the city uh, funded uh, in over a hundred billion dollars to community-based organizations. So we have over a hundred CBOs who are out doing engagement, town halls, outreach events, activities to support communities in making sure that they have the information to make an informed decision. So the first question is: Do people even um, un you know understand the science and the data? And that's important. And once then you have that factual information. How do we get it out? What are the type of spaces that we can really engage people in? And yes, there's a much broader conversation that we have to do, but how we transform the healthcare system that we can prevent uh, some of these incidents from happening in the first place. And acknowledging it is not enough. And that's the long-term work. And so as I've been saying in town halls is we can acknowledge it. Here's what we can do right now because we have a, a, a pandemic, once in a lifetime pandemic in front of us. Let's get out of this pandemic. Let's make sure that we are protected so that we can continue the conversation about how we transform that healthcare system. We cannot do all at once, um, but I do think it is an important conversation that we have in our recovery. Excellent, thank you. Um, anonymous attendee again. Um, I have family members who live in an economically challenged area. They have access to care, but the quality of that care is subpar. What can government entities do to entice good doctors to practice in these challenged communities? 
Um, yeah, I think this is a really important question. Um, you know, I think uh, part of it is really about how we invest in really keeping uh, amazing doctors into the communities. Uh, you know, we have seen different ways that it happened, investing in the healthcare institution uh, uh, that we're, we're in communities, when you think about Brooklyn or Harlem or the South Bronx, you know, investing in those healthcare, those healthcare systems directly so that they are able to pay uh, the providers. Um, also, uh, we have seen instances of loan repayment options really helping to keep individuals in their communities so that they are not making decisions about, well, I want to take this job because I need to take care of this medical debt uh, that, I, that I now have. Um, you know, these are all decisions uh, that I think goes into one's thinking about the jobs that they uh, that they take. Um, other other uh, strategies that we're really looking at the work that we do through our hospital quality improvement network is, you know, as I said earlier, doing a lot of the trainings around bias and uh, discrimination because the providers that are there. Um, what are we doing to sort of change their mindset to make sure that they are providing the best care? Uh, to the patients that they're seeing. Um, and then putting in the type of policies that I mentioned, so just like patient bill of rights, working with leadership to ensure that their institutional accountability uh, and, and, and ways in which people can report these issues. So I think that there is um, a, a lot of key work that we, we have to do. I think there's also ways that we can advocate to state and federal partners to make sure that this is something that continues to be invested in as well. Excellent, excellent. I have a question from uh, Maria Favuza, whom I know. Um, what can we do individually and as a community to correct the various inequities that are still present today? Yeah, that, this is um, this is a good question. Uh, you know, and I think uh, we have to just you know sort of think about you know how can we in our position uh, using our power uh, to one continue to raise awareness. I don't think we can minimize the point uh, that uh, everyone is not on the same page, right? They're not using the same language. And so the more that we are uh, understanding, the more that we're seeing this as an ongoing educational process to becoming anti-racist, to making sure that we're implementing anti-racism practices, uh, that is not gonna happen overnight. Um, I have work to do. Uh, we all have work to do to undo our biases. And so that is a, that's the most important point in part that you can do to not only for yourself, for family members as well. It is a process and I think that um, we cannot minimize it. I think that for those of us who are in government, we continue to look at ways that um, we are embedding equity, anti-racism, public health practices into our work. Um, for those of us who are in ways in which we can invest whether they're philanthropic or social responsibility um, uh, investment opportunities, is invest in these programs. Um, we know that uh, many of these programs are largely underinvested. We don't need more programs. We need better funding structure, funding mechanisms. Um, we don't need to prove that these programs work before we invest in them. And I think once we can shift our mind frame around what we need to do, right? Well, I need you to prove to me that this program is going to work before I invest in it. Um, and that, and that, that's the wrong way to think about it. Uh, and we need to really think about what are the programs that already exist? How can we really support uh, many of the, the homegrown programs in really uh, intentional ways? All right, I think we're almost finished. There's one last question. I have one last question of mine to close. Besides proof of COVID vaccinations for public venues and restaurants, how will New York City act, deal with outside tourism and reboosting the city's economy, especially in black slash brown owned businesses going forward? And do you believe the city will face long-term drought due to any current future restrictions? You know, well, I'll just say up front, you know, that, um, you know, many people have been blamed for not staying in their lane and talking about science or being a doctor. And certainly this is not my lane. Uh, and so I'll yeah. just say that up front. Um, that I, I am a physician, I'm not an economist, I do not have my MBA. Um, but I, what I will say is that um, uh, as a public health professional, I understand uniquely how our public health recovery is very much tied to our economic recovery. Um, we are thinking about that and the decisions that we make, the policies that we bring to the mayor. Uh, we, have, we have heard time and time again that this mayor uh, is thinking both about our public health goals as well as an economic recovery. Uh, and so I think uh, there are you know, lots more discussions um, that, that will happen. 
one, as we continue to see cases decrease, you know, what does that mean for some of our existing policies like key to NYC? Uh, what does that mean for our business sectors? How will that impact tourism, right? Um, those are really important questions, but I do not have a crystal ball. Um, and I think uh, as we continue to hear from the mayor about ways in which they're going to invest in our economy, um, I think we will continue to be, you know, feel somewhat reaffirmed and, uh, and have um, uh, some reassurance about what, what's to come. All right, and one sort of last question, which I think uh, it's impactful to me, and I think many people on the call, I think that might be a plus some here. What advice could you give to folks dealing you know, quote unquote, who are, you know, they think they're stable and mental health is okay, but what advice can you give us to sort of proactively maybe help engage our own, you know, sort of activism against, you know, keeping your health mental, you know, sort of a daily, weekly basis? What sort of tips could you could you give to us to maybe, I don't know, connect with our loved ones, connect with ourselves, whatever you think is pertinent? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, Laura, just starting with the point you just mentioned, I think we have to do some of that reconnection. Um, there is literally a process of rejoining uh, that people talk about uh, in, in sort of em e emotional emergency responses. Um, you know, we've seen this practice, you know, after Katrina. We've seen these responses after other public health emergencies. Uh, we have to we have to really think about what that rejoining looks like, right? Am I comfortable giving hugs? Am I going to continue to give elbow bumps? Um, you know, some of that personal touch is important and has been important to us for a very long time. Uh, it isn't just about, you know, sort of the eye contact or the head nod, you know, or the fist bump, right? People want to be able to embrace. Uh, and so I think we're going to have to sort of understand what that looks like over the coming days to months to years. Um, but certainly the things that we, we have to do, we have to continue to have conversations about this, see how we're showing up in our own household, you know, at, at, at the job. Are we easily triggered? I think we have to just be a little more reflective because um, we do see that. We do see individuals who are more triggered, right? easily angered. Um, and this doesn't mean that someone is crazy. We just need to be able to know our own signs, our own sort of, you know, stable point so that we can begin to seek help. Um, the other thing that's important is understanding where you can get help. I mentioned NYC Well, 188 NYC Well, uh, 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. Uh, we've increased our capacity because we have seen calls go up during this pandemic. Um, any resource that individuals are looking for, if they're looking for a therapist, uh, if they're looking to connect and, and just speak to someone, uh, as I mentioned, also being connected to the mobile crisis team. These are resources that are available you know, in New York City. Um, there are national uh, hotlines uh, as well that I don't have on the top of my head, but you know, those are just some of the things that I would just mention. Uh, and then for those of us, you know, who you know, already have a therapist uh, or someone that's seeking a therapist, I think it's really important to, to use those resources uh, as well. I also mentioned, uh, because we've been paying close attention uh, to our employee wellness programs, uh, offering peer support, uh, making sure that we are really amping up messaging to all of our employees. These are the resources that are available. Uh, please make it more convenient for your employees to connect to those resources, allow time off so folks can uh, access those resources as well. Uh, because we certainly have seen uh, and taking a, a lot of toll on our public health professionals across the country. And so it's really important for us to support our staff that way. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I want to say thank you for your time today. Um, I think we're pretty much a little over time. And then uh, I want you to have the last word. If anything else you want to say, express, this is, you know, this has been great for us and we, we thank you so much, but it, it's, it's your floor. Yeah, I, one, I just want to say a deep gratitude uh, to you, Lauren, again, to Holland and Knight uh, for providing this space uh, to, to center Black health and wellness uh, in, in a really intentional way. Uh, this conversation has to continue. It certainly is not starting today, not going to end uh, in, the, in the few minutes that we had uh, this afternoon. Um, and so just thinking about the spaces that you occupy, uh, the people that you interact with, um, just being able to continue the conversation. Um, in deep gratitude, uh, because we, don't, we do not get to 75% of New York is fully vaccinated. Um, we do not get to uh, you know, significant decreases uh, in our cases. Uh, without people really taking uh, the intentional uh, step to get vaccinated, to protect themselves. And so for those of you who are vaccinated, thank you. Uh, for those of you who have been continuing to do all the things that we've been asking around masking and testing, uh, sincere thank you as well. And, and obviously for those 
um, who are, are still uh, considering the vaccine. Uh, certainly we have uh, a number of different resources and we're here to help uh, individuals uh, as they need to answer their questions and address their concerns and we wanna see them get vaccinated. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Eastling, for being with us. And I want to thank uh, the people from my DE and I team, Nicole, Arlene, all the IT people, Damon Cowens, your good friend who helped me put this together. Um, and, um, and I look forward to exactly doing what you said, hopefully continuing this conversation with, with you and others. And you know, looking forward to the day when maybe you and I can just sit and have a drink and not worry about COVID and everything That's else. It. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our, um, our discussion for today. Thank you, everyone, and everyone have a great day.